I'm going to talk about a difficulty about informed consent in the context of randomized controlled trials. And I'll talk about that against a background of new, I mean, I'm probably not new to you, Bayesian ideas about statistical inference. And I'll argue that once you take these ideas on board, then they imply that the possibility of achieving equipoise in the context of RCTs is almost impossible. Okay, so that's quite a lot, but I'm going to keep it simple. So I hope I get through my time. So let me start with, with uh, statistical inference. And most of us, I take it, were brought up with the so-called logic of significance tests. I mean, I, I did my first degree was in mathematical statistics that I did in the in the sixties, and this was kind of orthodoxy. It stayed orthodoxy. I can remember even then I was a bit worried about it, and so were my professors. But uh, okay, let me remind you how it works. So you've got something you want to discover, right? Uh, some drug, say. Let, let, let's focus on the medical case and. Uh, does it have any efficacy? Does it make a difference to the probability of recovery? And uh, the null hypothesis will be, it makes a difference. It has no, no uh, causal significance. And then the alternative hypothesis is that the drug is efficacious. I mean, okay, does it mean, efficacious means it works in the context of the kind of patients you have in the trial, and will it be effective with a wider population? Sridhar yesterday raised that kind of issue. Let's not worry about that. We'll just stick with it. Uh, either it has no effect or it has some effect. And the idea of a significance test is that you're going to observe some statistic, the difference in the time of recovery of the people with the drug and without the drug. And you, you set up a rejection a region in the space of the statistic that uh, you will only land in with a 5% chance if the null hypothesis is true. So the rejection region, you're only going to uh, uh, get there if, uh, the null, if the null hypothesis is true 5% of the time. So chances are, if chances are, you very not what to remember that, if you're in the rejection region, the alternative hypothesis is true. Uh, the drug is effective. The thing I want to focus on is that the logic of statistic significance tests uh, manages, and this for many people back in the day was the virtue, it manages with a very limited palette of attitudes to hypotheses. All you're going to do is either you're agnostic about the hypotheses, either you would Reject the null hypothesis to say you conclude it's false, uh, or, or you accept you accept the alternative hypothesis. You conclude it's true, and you don't need to think about any more attitudes to the hypotheses than agnosticism, accept, reject. So the standard procedure is you you don't know if the drugs are uh, 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 efficacious or not. You start agnostic, and you perform the test. And if the results in the rejection region then what you're supposed to do is reject the null hypothesis, accept the alternative hypothesis. And the rationale for doing that is, if the null hypothesis is true, this will only lead you astray uh, one time in 20. 5% chance of a type, a type 1. Uh, if you get an insignificant result, now it's not so clear what you're supposed to do. Fisher, who originally thought about significance tests, said, well, in that case, uh, we don't know any probabilities here. We should just remain agnostic. Uh, things are nothing's proven. We still will say agnostic. Uh, Neyman and Pearson wanted to do better. Their their line of thought is well, if you get an insignificant result, maybe you should reject the hunt and conclude that the drug is ineffective. So you know, we we could talk about uh, none of these recommendations make any sense at all, actually. But uh, uh, we could talk about the difference if you want to. But but the point I want to emphasize is that all these accounts are working with just these three attitudes towards hypothesis. Either you're agnostic, or you're sure of the hypothesis, or you're sure uh, that it's false. OK. 
So that's that significance test. And that's what kind of every science student has been taught for the last hundred years. I think now it's stopping, thank goodness. But that, that was the that was the tradition through the 20th century and into the 21st. Now, in fact, the logic, so-called logic significance test, is completely hopeless. It, it's, uh, the trouble is it doesn't take any account of how plausible the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis are. How plausible is it that this drug, drug makes a, a difference? And the idea that you can arrive at uh, uh, a firm attitude to the hypothesis on the basis of some uh, little or not so little study without taking into account how plausible the hypothesis is to start with is completely crazy. And I'll, I'll demonstrate this now. Right? Suppose that, I mean, uh, medical scientists are very enthusiastic researchers. They keep on coming up with all these ideas, right? Suppose, suppose for the sake of the argument that for every hypothesis they test, only one is true. I mean, they, they'll have 999 dud hypotheses for every, every good one. Well, then what's going to happen is that 50 of the dud hypotheses, just under 50 of them, will deliver a significant result because one in 20 times when you've got a true null hypothesis, you'll get a significant result. That's what the rejection region was designed to be. Uh, and so will the, 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 the one good case will probably give you a significant result as well. So when you get a significant result, you're told, okay, now you accept the alternative hypothesis, but on the assumption that I made here, that only one in a hundred, one in a thousand alternative hypotheses are true, you're accepting something that only has a 2% chance of being true. Completely bonkers. Uh, and uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's one of the greatest intellectual scandals of the modern world. That, that, that all science students were taught this nonsense for a hundred years. I mean, it's, it really is scandalous. And finally, the, the chickens have come home to roost because this little kind of flaw in the logic of the tests is probably the explication of the, the replication crisis. That is, scientists are very keen on testing any hypothesis they think of. And, uh, uh, not all of them, in fact, majority of probably no good, but every so often, one time in 20, with the dud hypotheses, they get a significant result, they're published in the journal, uh, everybody accepts it. Uh, the Bayer, Chem Bayer Chemical Company got very worried that a lot of their research was based on studies that, that couldn't be replicated, so they, I mean, their research wasn't going well, they, they, they tried to check out what was the problem, and they discovered that their research scientists were taking papers from the journals, and two thirds of them didn't hold up when you redid the test. So, okay. Uh, if you want to, if you want to see this analysis of where the replication crisis comes from, there's uh, a, a nice paper by the previous uh, Sabi professor of philosophy of medicine at King's, uh, Alexander Bird, in the British Journal of Philosophy of Science. Uh, the replication crisis is. A base rate fallacy, they weren't taking into account that of all the hypotheses tested, only one in a thousand or whatever was, was true. And I argued just the same thing in a more knockabout article in the TLS for non, non philosophy scientists uh, at the same time. So, what's the moral? The moral is the, I think, now familiar one that we need a more nuanced the more Bayesian range of attitudes to hypotheses. We need to start with some initial idea of how likely some hypothesis to be. I mean, if all you know is that on average one in a thousand hypotheses turn out to be true, well then your initial uh, uh, credence in the truth of hypothesis will be 0.01. Uh, uh, I mean, that's just a made up case. And in real cases, you have lots of other information, uh, different, different uh, likelihoods in different subjects, uh, lots of prior background information that makes you think the hypothesis is plausible, maybe some, some hypothesis about the mechanisms involved and so on. But you need to start with some, some judgment about how likely the hypothesis is, and then update that in the light of evidence. And uh, it's not the evidence is no good in the case that I had in mind, where it's only one in a thousand of truth. 
your credit, your credence and the hypothesis goes up from one in a thousand to one in 50. But the point I want to get across is that we need to be working with the kind of quantified set of attitudes to hypotheses. Just trying to get away with agnostic receptor, reject, rejective set is just not going to do, do the job. So that's the model of the replication process. Okay, now turn to RCTs. And perhaps you can see where I'm going. The worry is to take a normal randomized control trial where we have treatment, alternative treatment, maybe placebo. Uh, won't the doctors generally have different credences about the efficacy of the treatments on the different arms of the trial? And in that case, what do the doctors do? Asking the patient to agree to getting treatments at random when chances are, well, it's, it, there's a, a good chance the patient will end up with uh, a normal optimal treatment. It, the problem is obvious in the case where uh, you're, you're testing against placebo, where the placebo treatment is, is one of the arms. But this, the problem is still there if you've got a new drug and a standard treatment, and uh, uh, doctors will likely have different credences in the efficacy of the different treatments. Uh, but they say, would you, would, to the patients, would you mind entering into the trial? Uh, well, we can talk later about what, what exactly the doctors say. I, I, I don't know, but uh, uh, I'm worried that they don't emphasize the possibility that some patients are going to do treatments that the doctors don't think are the best treatments. Okay, some, some defend, so there's quite a lot of literature on, on, on this issue, and some of it defends RCTs against this worry, especially in connection with trials against placebo, by distinguishing research ethics from clinical ethics, right? Clinical ethics is what, you know, you go to the doctor and uh, you go into the doctor for the best treatment, the doctor has the duty to give you the best treatment. Research ethics, uh, the, the, the aim of the researcher is to find out things that aren't found out yet, terribly important, and, and the ethics are different. Yeah, it's an important distinction. And in this context, I don't have the difficulty with the idea that a researcher will say to a, a, a prospective subject, we're doing experiments in which you might end up with an inferior treatment, uh, area as far as I, I judge, uh, and would you like to volunteer in the interest of advancing, advancing knowledge? I've got no problem about that at all. My worry is uh, about uh, doctors, either research doctors or, or practicing clinicians, uh, suggesting to patients that they enter into a trial without making it clear to them that they're in danger of getting a suboptimal treatment. Here's another issue I want to put to one side. Sometimes a, a promising, attractive, desirable new treatment is only available in the context of a trial because it hasn't yet got, got uh, regulatory approval. In that case, a patient might well feel it's in their interest to, to enter it, to a trial in the hope of getting the promising new treatments. But I want to think about the cases where that's, that's not the, the issue. Now, the standard defense of, of conducting RCTs that aren't justified in the way I've just described, uh, you, you appeal to the, 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 the patient's uh, uh, public spirit, or, or you tell them that the, the, the promising drug isn't available except for the trial. The, the other defense is the doctors will say they're equipoise between the two treatments. We don't know which treatment is better, and so there's no reason for the patient to, end up, to worry about ending up on the bad arm. And the main point I want to make in this talk is that this talk of equipoise is ambiguous. Uh, it's ambiguous between what I'm calling here one uncertain. The doctors haven't reached a definite conclusion about which arm is better. And the other one, properly neutral. The doctors do not have any preference for one treatment over the other. They have the same credence in the efficacy of each arm. 
And uh, the worry I have is the doctors will say we're equipoised, say to the patient, no need to worry about an inferior treatment. As soon as one is satisfied, then in fact, what they really need to have in order to say that is two. One's easy to achieve. I mean, when are we certain of anything? Uh, I always uh, got some doubt about the hypothesis, but it's nice to have some more research to, to make us uh, sure. Uh, so, oh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know what your uh, standard of certainty is, but uh, uh, for any reason, the standard of certainty is, it's easy to say we're not certain, but it doesn't seem to me uh, that it makes any sense to say that you can. Tell the patient, don't worry about inferior treatment as soon as you're not certain. Surely what we need is to be properly neutral. And now we've recognized that serious medical thinking needs a range of attitudes that go beyond just simple agnostic risk, reject, accept. Surely we shouldn't be telling patients that it doesn't matter what arm they're on, unless you really have the same credence in the efficacy of each arm, which I worry will scarcely ever be the case. So, and I could give you examples. Here's a striking example from a, a recent surgical RCT with a placebo on. In fact, I should have written this, but I, I wrote a paper, an article in the New Statesman um, a couple of years ago about this trial and how iffy it seemed to me. Um, so this was a trial on shoulder surgery, it was a very good trial, discovered that standard social surgery wasn't worth very much. They had three arms, they did the, the standard treatment, they did watchful waiting, they did a full on placebo surgical operation. They cut the people up, they did nothing and they sewed them up again. And uh, they, they, I've got the patient information sheet, uh, uh, they didn't, they didn't describe the placebo arm as a placebo arm, they just described it as another operation. And later in the information sheet, they say, any one of the three treatments would be a good option for you. And until we've completed the study, we can't be sure which one is best. And uh, I mean, in, in the discussion after my article, they said, no, no, it was perfectly okay what we did because, because of equipoise. We had equipoise. We weren't sure uh, that the, the treatment did any good or, uh, Indeed, they weren't, but uh, yeah, it's unlikely that the placebo arm is going to do better than the standard treatment, and uh, we didn't tell the patients that. Okay, the medical ethics literature contains quite a lot of discussion about exactly what equipoise is supposed to be, and it raises some interesting issues, but as far as I know, it might have changed recently because I haven't really uh, done, done research on this for three or four years. Uh, none of the stuff I looked at until then uh, addressed the issue that I'm worried about. So one issue that's much discussed is, should, we, should the individual doctor, does the individual doctor need to be equipoised? Or, uh, I mean, the worry is that suppose it's an individual doctor who's not sure that the standard treatment is, is uh, uh, better, but the medical community uh, all knows it. I mean, sorry, yeah, oh, the medical community all knows for sure that it is. Does that justify the individual doctor saying, uh, does the matter which arm? And, and there's an argument, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be exposed just as the individual doctor who might be a bit uh, uh, dippy. Uh, is equipoise, you need the community to be equipoised. Uh, a variant of this thought is it shouldn't be which people are actually equipoised, but whether a reasonable or well-informed person would be equipoised. And, and these are interesting arguments, and I guess the community is better than the individual, and reasonable is better than the community. Uh, but none of them think of what's required of the individual or the community, a reasonable person, as anything more than not being certain. They think that it's it's fine for equipoise, whoever is required to be equipoised, that they don't know for sure, uh, they don't require 
that they have to be properly neutral and have the same credence in the different drives. Okay, so I'll just finish with some examples. I mean, here's the original declaration of Helsinki World Medical Association about the ethics of, of controlled trials. And we should be assured of the best diagnosis if it's proven. But if it's not yet proven, I would like to do some more research, then that's enough to, to conduct a trial, including if there's a placebo. Uh, if you aren't sure that the, the standard treatment is better, perfectly okay to put people into, into randomized trials. Now, this, this actually doesn't talk about, about equipoise and informed consent, but it gives you the, the idea. Uh, no worries about conducting a trial uh, with an inferior arm if your evidence is less than conclusive for the, the treatment in question. Here's Friedman back in 87. This is the paper that raised the thought that we shouldn't be looking at the individual, but the, the community. Uh, 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 so it starts off, equipoise is a state of genuine uncertainty on part of the investigator. Doesn't like that so much. I suggest an alternative concept of equipoise, which is genuine uncertainty within the expert medical community. But uncertainty, Less than 100% sure the treatment is better, that's enough to say you're equipoised and tell the patient is not. Uh, this one is just somebody repeating the, the Friedman point. Uh, there must be controversy within the scientific community, uh, either because the researchers are uncertain or different, slightly different case if, they, if they're certain they disagree. But uncertainty is enough. And here's somebody fighting back against Friedman and the community idea, saying, no, no, it's the individual doctor who should be worrying about the ethics of the doctor uh, uh, can't do a trial if, if she's certain. Uh, forget about the community, it's the individual doctor. But this quote ends up by saying, uh, uh, you can still gonna have a lot of extra poison control studies because even though you have a hunch that one treatment arm is better than another, they're often not certain. And when they're not certain, then, then control trials are ethical. So that's my, my story. Uh, uh, now, the, on the other side, I haven't mentioned this. I mean, of course, it's highly desirable that we get to know for sure. I mean, no, not absolutely for sure, but. Uh, effectively for sure about the efficacy of treatment. It's desirable that we do do this research. And, then, I mean, and, and doing research, uh, randomized controlled search has a lot, of, a lot of methodological advantages. And there's a worry that if we adopt the standards of equipoise I'm talking about, it's gonna be very hard to enroll subjects in RCTs. I mean, the doctors won't anymore be able to say, we don't know where equipoise equal. They'll, they'll have to say, well, I think, you know, it was mine. With my child there, I've used RMA, but in the interest of, in the interest of greater knowledge, we want you to agree to randomize the treatment. And I think if, if the doctors attended to the points I've raised, there wouldn't be any, well, there wouldn't be any, there wouldn't be very many RCTs being conducted. So there is a kind of uh, ethical choice here, ethical dilemma. Do, do we value the, the utilitarian advantage of the greater knowledge for the community over the duty of the clinician to uh, give the patient in front of them who's come to them for help the best treatment. But my view is that uh, I'm, I'm quite inclined to be consequential and utilitarian in general. But in this case, it seems to me absolutely obvious that a patient who goes to the clinician hoping for the best treatment they can get should not be deceived into a trial in the interest of, of greater knowledge. That just seems to me wrong. So I'll stop. That's it.